So I want to talk today about a concept that has had a lot of buzz, but a lot of people don't know what it's about, and also a lot of people uh, don't exactly know how it's relevant for them. And this, this concept is, is big data. And it's interesting because when people talk about big data, I see sometimes there are two camps. There's some people who are very much in favor of it, and sometimes they have a vested interest because they want you to buy their big data services. And also there are some people who are very much against it. They poo-poo the idea. And sometimes, again, they have vested interests because some of the services that they offer uh, are now going to be replaced or partially replaced by big data. Now, I don't have a horse in this race. Uh, I don't have a foot in either camp. Uh, and I'm just here to provide some valuable information about what it is so that you can decide for your business, for yourself, and for your, maybe even for your industry, how it's relevant for you and what you can do to take advantage of it. So let's start off with, uh, let me just see who's in the room and get an idea of what you know about big data. So when you when you hear that when you hear that phrase big data, what does it actually mean for you? So I'm going to run a poll, and the poll is just multiple choice. You just choose one of the options, and I'll just launch the poll now, so you can see the options coming up. Uh, so on your screen, you can choose one of those options there. And I've said, okay, so the first option is ha, huh, never heard of it. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, but you don't know what it means. Um, maybe if maybe you know what it means, but you don't quite get the relevance of it, and maybe you're full bottle on it, and you're the you're the person who should be presenting this webinar rather than I. Okay, so great, 80% of people have voted, so I'll leave the poll open just for a couple more seconds, and then I'll close it and show the results. All right, thank you everyone. So let me close down the poll and uh, share the results. Okay, so the results are not surprising for the people who are turning up to this webinar, and I know it's a little bit self-selecting because uh, people who are turning up here are either have heard of it but don't know what it means, which is about half, or know what it means but not the relevance of it. So great, this uh, this webinar is for you. So let me hide those results and let's continue. And uh, now I have got an additional resource for you uh, at the end of the webinar. It's not one that I wrote, but it's one that PwC Price Waterhouse Coopers wrote, which is all about big data. It's just a, it's an introduction to big data uh, in a business context. And if you want to know a little bit more than what I'm going to share with you today, then this is a really good introduction. And if you complete the exit survey at the end of this webinar, I'll send you the link so you can download that. Because what I can do today in the short time that we've got available is I can't tell you everything that you need to know about big data, but I can give you a bit of an overview so that you understand a few of the concepts and then you can go off and find more, uh, for more information about it to find out exactly how it's going to be relevant for you. So that's available to you at the end of the webinar. If you complete the exit survey, that'll pop up on your screen when, you uh, when the webinar ends. So I want to sh talk about big data, not in very, very technical terms, but in terms of how it relates to us as people. And I'm going to talk about it at these three levels. So the first thing is what is uh, big data in terms of what organizations know about you as an individual? So that's the first section. The second one is big data in terms of what organizations know about you and your network. So it may be a social network, your online network, your network of friends and family and uh, other people in your in your community and then the the area that i'm really excited about is big data in terms of aggregating information from lots and lots of people maybe from around the world and how organizations can use that to improve our lives um but by, by looking at big data on a very on a global scale so we'll talk about, uh, and when I've said improve our lives, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons as well. Um, but we'll look at it in these three areas. I'm really interested in this third area, so we'll we'll spend more time in that one than in the other two. However, I do want to talk about the other two as well, because many organizations, whether they're government, political, um, businesses, um, not-for-profits, are using big data in all the all of the three areas, and particularly in one and two as well. So that's an overview of what we're going to cover in the next 25 minutes. So let's start with the first one. And this first one is about you as an individual. So what does somebody know about you and how can they use that to ideally to enhance uh, to enhance the products and services that they offer you. And, and I like to think of this as, uh, I know what you did last summer. So in other words, it's the, the data that an organization collects about you as an individual and continues to collect about you. And, and generally with your consent, 
So it's generally you've given them permission to do it. You may not realize the consequence of giving them permission, but generally it's not secretive, um, it's not um, surveillance of you, it's uh, information that you have provided, but how are organizations using that? So let me show you some examples, and this webinar is very much going to be about examples. I'm not going to go into the theory of big data, I'm not going to go into a lot of the technical details, but I'll share with you a whole bunch of examples so you understand the concept. So for example, I shop at Woolies and I've got a Woolies rewards card and they've just changed their rewards program so that I get discounts when I when I you know, buy a certain amount. So instead of going and buying local, uh, bigger organizations like Woolworths are trying to entice us to, to shop with them by offering things like rewards. And the rewards card gives me discounts. It used to give me frequent flyer points. Um, so why do they do that? Because uh, one is, of course, they want you to come in and shop at their shop, but also it allows them to capture information about my shopping habits. And based on that, Woolies could decide, it doesn't at the moment, but it could, if it wanted to, email me every week with specials based on, not just the specials that it's having for the week, but specials based on my buying habits. If it knows that I buy certain products, it could create tailored emails for me. In the future, as I walk into the store, it could know that my card's in my wallet and it'll be able to scan it secretly and show ads for me personalized uh, based on what I what I'm going to buy or my smartphone could beep and say here are the specials in this store in aisle seven you can go and buy muesli bars at 20% off. So that's an example of a company that could be using this data that it collects uh, over time about me and uh, in order to customize the, the experience for me. An example, which is a, a slightly more controversial example, is that Target in the USA a few years ago uh, was, a, was the subject of this controversy because it sent a teenage girl a catalog uh, in the mail, uh, which was uh, a catalog of baby products. And this is a teenage girl who was living at home and her parents were outraged and they went to the local Target store and they berated the manager saying, are you trying to get my daughter pregnant? Uh, because he's sending her this uh, catalog of baby products, it turns out that she was already pregnant and Target knew that because of changes to her buying patterns uh, in, in the previous few weeks and some computer algorithm had detected that she was now buying things, not even maternity things, but the, the sort of foods that she, were buy, she was buying was different, she may have stopped buying alcohol and they looked at that and they said that pattern indicates that she's probably pregnant and so they started, they, they changed what they were sending to her, to her mailing address, they sent her a catalog with which was preparing her for becoming a mother and uh, of course that caused a lot of controversy and Target backed down from that and the latest that I heard was that they did they didn't stop sending it. What they did was they sent a more general catalog, but with a higher focus on baby products. So you couldn't detect that they were actually targeting uh, pregnant girls or women, um, but they were still doing it. They were still doing that. So that's an example, again, where they look at individual buying patterns. Um, here's another one, uh, Microsoft Connect, which is one of the fastest growing technologies ever, faster than even iPhones and iPads with the Xbox 360. Microsoft Connect is one of those game playing uh, devices that lets you stand in front of your TV and make, you know, make weird movements and it actually detects it. And, um, you know, you can play games that way. But Microsoft has also said to retailers that there's a way that they can use the Connect software to detect when people come into a shop. Uh, it's got facial recognition, and so it can detect who's coming into the store. And based on that, they can do the sort of things I was talking about earlier with rewards cards, so that if you come back into the shop the next time, it recognizes you and uh, it tracks your movements around the shop. Now, this might sound a lot big, very big brotherish, but many shops are already doing this. Uh, they're even able to use the fact that that you're walking in with a phone and if your phone automatically looks around for Wi-Fi networks um, around and automatically detects them, then inside the shop it can it can pretty much detect your phone and it can track your movements around the shop. It can see where you go, uh, where you spend most of your time, uh, what you do when you're um, as you're taking your journey around the shop. It doesn't know you personally, but it can track you by your phone and that's just about you know, as good as knowing you personally. So that's some of the technology that's available uh, to be able to track individuals. Um, here's another one, which is again that retailers are using, uh, and this is to alert retailers about potential shoplifters. You may have seen a controversial story in Australia in the last couple of weeks where uh, some 
some students who were walking into who walked into a Melbourne uh, Apple store, they were accosted by security guards because they were black, and the security guard said, "Oh, you know, the manager's worried that you might steal something." And of course, that caused a controversy, and uh, Apple came down pretty hard on them and said, "Every store." around the world, starting in Australia, now has to redo their, their training uh, for diversity and inclusion. Um, but, um, and that, that was because the security guards and the managers made a decision based on what people looked like rather than them individually. So it did racial profiling. But it is possible for them to, uh, for people to have a list of um, known shoplifters and when they walk into the store you can detect who they are. So this is an example, this is not of a shoplifter, but an example of facial recognition to be able to detect people who they can uh, recognize people who they've already recognized before and take appropriate action based on that. Okay, so that's the first area which is big data uh, where organizations know something about you personally and generally it's information that you have disclosed or is somehow like you know it's available. Um, so things like Microsoft Connect, you don't necessarily know that the shop's tracking what you're doing but you know you, you have made that information available and there will be people who take advantage of that. You hope for your good and to provide you a better experience. Okay, let me just stop and see if there's any questions about that. Can you stop stores tracking you? Uh, so there's a question from Jim. Yes, you can. Um, yes and no. So things like f uh, face recognition, you probably can't. Excuse me, but things like um, whether people are tracking your phone as you walk into store, yes, you can, you can stop that. And the, the way to do that is slightly inconvenient, but what you do is you put turn your phone off or put into airplane mode or even turn off Wi-Fi and uh, that'll stop <coughs> sorry that'll stop some of the tracking that's happening because a, a number of these this this tracking software is looking for things like phones that are looking for wi-fi connections so that's how you stop that sort of traffic tracking from happening but it's not possible to stop everything um you'd have to w walk walk around with a mask on if you want to stop people from tracking your your own face okay any other questions Okay, good. Let me continue. So the second area is, this is quite an interesting area and it's become quite popular recently because of the rise of social networks and the, the influence that we have as individuals simply because of our connections and our networks. And this is the idea that, uh, as I've said here, uh, birds of a feather flock together. So this is the, the idea that generally uh, people like you so you, you tend to hang out with people like you rather than random people. And we like to think that we are individual and uh, we are all unique. But in fact, there are a lot of things about us that are common and you can detect that and by the sort of people we hang out with. So we hang out with people like us. Um, okay, I've just thought to see a few comments coming in from earlier. So let me read that before we get onto this second section. Ah, okay, so Ross says that she does get emails from Woolworths targeting what she prefers from previous purchases. So maybe I just haven't turned that box on um, or maybe I've deliberately turned it off and I actually would like that. So I need to uh, research that so I can turn that box on because I would like to know that that's useful for me. Uh, Anne says there's a talk about making baby formula available to card holders when there's a shortage. So again, this is one of those incentives where there's something like certain brands of baby formula are scarce in Australia now because there's a big market for them in China. And then an incentive might be that if you hold a rewards card, then you go to the front of the, you go to the, front of the queue. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of incentive to find out information, uh, to get people onto their database so you can track information about them. It's why we as business owners also want to do things like get somebody's email address when they visit our website so that then we can send them information later and then ideally what you'd want to do is then based on their purchasing habits or even their habits when they're track uh, when they're moving around your website you want to send them a customized email um, and Ross says scary stuff how to turn it off yes so you might have to go in and check your uh, check your account settings at Woolies Ross to see how you can do that Okay, so let's look at the second area and this is, as I said, looking at your network and your community and how big data is being used that way. So this is not just the information about you, but it's the information about people like you. 
So, for example, here's a very positive example, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, this is a car insurance company. And the way that insurance companies have traditionally worked is that they know based on your age, where you live, um, and a little bit about your driving history, they know the likelihood that you're going to be in an accident and they're going to have to pay out. So they base their premiums on that. Now, Guevara, Guevara is an insurance company that does things slightly differently. So they still have that as a default option, but they also give you an option to get together with a whole bunch of your friends and say that you would like to buy your insurance together. And if your friends have a really good driving history and you and your friends have a good driving history, then your premiums are lower. And your your premiums go towards um, paying out if there is a, if there's any sort of claim. So uh, the idea is that you pay less, but you've also got a smaller pool of money to call from if there's an accident. But you know, you're saying that you and your friends are safe drivers, so there's less chance of an accident. And if there's money left over from the premiums at the end of the year, then you get a bit of a refund from that as well. So they're really targeting people who are saying, okay, well, I'm going to take the chance that um, I know that my friends are going to be safe, are also safe drivers, so uh, I want to have a lower premium. And so we'll pool our resources and go to uh, go to this car insurance company. It's not the same as saying, uh, oh, we've got 100 people. Will you give us a lower premium? It's not that. What he's saying is we've got 100 people and they're also really good drivers. Uh, therefore, we would like you to, uh, to give us a lower premium. So that's one simple example of people who are um, banding together. And uh, uh, this is big data based on community and network, not just based on individuals. Another one which you would have seen if you've ever bought from Amazon.com is this very simple thing that says customers who bought this also also bought this. So my, my book club this week, we were talking about the book Think Like a Freak. Uh, and when I bought the book on Amazon, it also says here are some other books that you might be interested in. Uh, based on, so some of them might be the same author, but it doesn't necessarily use that to, to figure out what to recommend. It just says other customers bought who bought this book also bought this. So it's likely that because we know that you're similar to other customers, uh, then you're likely to like those books as well. And again, we like to think that we're really individual, but chances are that we're very similar to other people as well. Um, for example, if you are sorry, if you want to know more, then read this book Connected. It's a great book by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler about what you know we used to talk about six degrees of separation, but really is three degrees of separation now. So three degrees of separation is pretty much everything you need to know about what people's purchasing habits are, what their political um ideology is likely to be, what their religion is likely to be, what their preferences are likely to be, what social networks uh, they're on. If you look at the people who are three degrees connected to you, that pretty much, um, you know, the, the data available from those people uh, is pretty much enough to be able to predict how you will behave, uh, what you will buy, uh, what you think as well. Okay, so let me just see any questions. Uh, Yep, okay, so Ros has made a comment about uh, Amazon and switching between the US and the Australian site. Uh, that's right, the, that, that is, that's a little bit inconvenient. Um, and again, I think this is one of those things that in the future, there may only be one, there may be one site so that, so that you get, get the more data, uh, so the organization can get the more data about you. So a lot of this stuff is happening online anyway, because online it's so much easier to track people and track people's actions. You can see where people's mouse is moving and how fast it's moving. That's not so easy in the physical world yet. However, that is becoming easier. A, one, because you have, you have your smartphone around with you all the time, and so that makes it easy to track. And uh, the second reason is because of things like Connect technology and face recognition technology um, and really good sort of video cameras in stores that will allow you to track things like not only recognize faces, but recognize emotions on faces. So that's really, uh, that's really where we're heading as well. And organizations who are taking advantage of this are tapping into that, that idea of big data there as well. Okay, any other comments? Okay, I see scary stuff from a couple of people, but you know, again, this doesn't have to be scary. It could also be something that could be um, a positive use in our lives. All right, so let me look at the third area, and this is the one that I'm really, that, that I find fascinating, and it's this idea that you are, uh, and the, you know, it's, uh, there's this, there's this funny phrase, you're unique, just like everybody else. So we like to think that we're different from everybody and we're unique, and we absolutely are. However, we're much more similar than we are different. 
than everybody else. And now um, it's possible for the data about us to be used by computers who are now, which are now smart enough or powerful enough to be able to process the data in ways that mean that they can, you know, they can predict things about us based on what they know about everybody else in the world. Okay, so yes, so Rose says, is that an oxymoron? Absolutely it is. So that's, uh, uh, comedians have used this line, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely unique, just like everybody else in the world. So yes, okay, so I have a comp, uh, I'm gonna have a play a little game here, and I've got a prize available, so uh, we're gonna play a game of knots and crosses, very easy game to play, and uh, if you win, then I will send you a copy of the my book, The Future of Leadership. So I'd like a volunteer, and if you'd like to volunteer, just say so in the question box, and if you'd like a copy of my book, um, just say so in the question box. Okay, so Tessa says yes, please. So Tessa, um, we're going to play a very simple game of knots and crosses, um, and you know the rules. So the rule is that, uh, well, in fact, to give me a bit of an advantage, I'm going to start. So I'm going to start with, um, I'll play crosses, so I'll play my X. So I will play an X here, and remember the rule is the first person to get three in a row uh, is a winner. So Tessa, if you can just type in the question box, um, you're going to put an O in one of these boxes. Just type in the number of the box. I've numbered them from one to nine to make it easy for you. Okay, so Tessa gets five. Okay, so I'm going to make my next move. Okay, so I'm going to go four. Tessa, what's your next move? Okay, just thinking away. Eight. So Tessa's going to go eight. Okay. Uh, let me go again. Okay. I'm going to go nine. Okay. Tessa's is going to go three. Okay. I'm going to go six. And Tessa's going to, uh, Tessa's going to go seven, so she wins. All right, great. Three O's in a row. Not so great for me, but that's okay. I'm happy to send Tessa a copy of my book. Tessa, I don't think I have your postal address, so if you don't mind, just you can either email it to me, so go to gihanpro.com and send, uh, find my email, or just type your postal address in the question box and I'll send it to you. Okay, so that was interesting, right? So uh, some people, in fact, a couple of people mentioned they had dice rolling in the background and that's exactly what I was doing. So the way I was playing for my moves was part of the first one, so I decided to go two and uh, after Tessa's move there, I just rolled, die, uh, rolled a couple of dice and that determined what move I would make next. So I wasn't doing the most intelligent knots and crosses strategy uh, and as it turned out, it turned out to be a losing strategy because all I was doing was making random moves at that point. So we started with, so here's a point, so by loading the dice, I can may I can improve my strategy. And the way I load the dice is like this. So we started by going, okay, we're gonna go two, I started with two, Tessa said five, and I said four. So two, five, four, and so when I chose four there, it ended up losing me the game. So what I can do is load the dice, uh, so I t if this was a computer program, I would tell the computer program, okay, if you ever see the pattern two, five, and you're rolling the dice for your next random move, because four led to a loss, um, just decrease the odds of rolling a four. And if we play this again, uh, again, then uh, I might have won, or the computer might have won. And in that case, it might have been two, five, I don't know, one, and, if that, have, if that had been a winning uh, sequence, then I would load the dice so that one would be better, um, more likely next time around. So this is what I'm doing. All I'm doing is rewarding the, the sequence that leads to a win, uh, and I'm penalizing the sequences that lead to a loss. And over time, so like two, five, one may, may not always be a winning strategy, but over time you play millions and millions of games, and the dice become loaded to the extent that it's, it's more likely to win, or you know, in Norse and Cross, it's always going to be a draw if everyone plays the, the right, uh, plays well, but it's going to be a winning strategy, or at least a non-losing strategy. And all you do is you play millions and millions of times, and you never learn a real strategy. So for example, humans would know this a real strategy as saying, you should always start, sorry, if you start, if you start with a corner, then the only way to avoid a loss is to play in the middle. So if I start with one, then any other move apart from five 
um, is going to be a losing move. Okay, so that's a strategy that humans learn. But a computer never needs to understand it at that level. All it does is plays a game millions and millions of times, and eventually it will come up with that, that same strategy, but it would never even understand that says that if you start with a corner, you must always play in the center. It just knows that it's got these loaded dice that over millions and millions of experiments and trials has ended up with a winning strategy. And that's what happens. That's what happens with, with this machine learning or what's called predictive analytics. So you, you play, basically a computer's playing noughts and crosses millions and millions of times and rolling the dice every time gets rewarded for the times that it, it wins and gets penalized for the times that it loses and based on that it becomes smarter so that's one of the biggest areas of machine intelligence and it's one of the biggest areas of big data um, uh, learning for the future for example let me show you some uh, three examples of that in financial planning there's this idea called robo advice which is the idea that instead of you going to a financial planner financial advisor for your advice you fill in a form online and it's spits out a financial plan for you. At the moment, it's pretty simple, um, and a lot of financial planners are going, no, this is no good. This is only really good if you've got a very simple, very simple circumstances. But they ignore this idea that robo-advice can make millions and millions of um, financial plans and bits of financial advice. It can measure what happens with the investments that it predicts, and, oh, sorry, that, that it recommends, and then based on that, it can start rewarding and penalizing, so the next time it makes better predictions um, about better recommendations based on the predictions that it's making about how those investments are going to perform. So that's an example of an industry that's really going to be transformed by big data because of this predictive analytics. Healthcare is another example. Uh, there's this device called a live core, which allows you, instead of you going off to your, if you've got a heart condition, instead of you going off to your doctor every six months for this expensive series of tests, you can attach this to your iPhone and do an ECG yourself and the data is sent wirelessly to a monitoring center, and then specialists will look at that and go, okay, there's something wrong here, you need to do something about it. But in the future, what's going to happen is going to collect all that data in about 10 years' time. The developers and the investors predict they'll have enough information to be able to predict heart attacks and strokes before they occur. And it's the same kind of software that we just played knots and crosses with. It's just rolling the dice millions of times, looking at what happens, and then going, okay, when I see this little pattern in an ECG, this is what it means. And the patterns are going to be so subtle and complex that humans, specialists, will never even after they know what the pattern looks like, they'll never be able to understand why that led to a heart attack, but because we're all like everybody else, the computer has figured it out. Um, here's another example. Predictive policing is this system that's being used in the US, it's being rolled out in other parts of the world as well, in the UK, they're just trialing it, where computer software predicts which regions, which areas, which towns, suburbs, counties, what time of the day, and what sort of buildings are likely to be the subject of crime. So the the cops send their send their um, limited forces to those places which are predicted by computer algorithms and software, and they're the places that the computer says is mo most likely to be a crime spot, and therefore they allow they they can focus their efforts there. So those are just some examples of being able to use big data based on computers becoming being so powerful now and being able to process information faster than ever before and better than humans could ever do. I remember when I was a kid, when I was first learning about some of this stuff and I was interested in some of this stuff, um, I, the, the theory at the time was, yeah, this is all really good, but computers just aren't fast enough. So it's the way that we learn as well. It's the way that babies learn, but babies learn by getting millions of pieces of information coming into their, uh, into their, through their five senses every day and computers just would never be able to cope with that. Now, they can, they absolutely can do that uh, because they've got to that level of power. All right. Um, okay, great. So Anne says, have I, have I seen the TV show Persons of Interest? And uh, great, I, I haven't seen that, but I will definitely look out for that. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so those are the three areas. So three levels of big data I've covered here. I've only given you an overview, but I hope I've given you some examples that when you, 
when you download that uh, the the report uh, that I'll send to you from PwC, or when you hear other people talk about big data, these are sort of things we're talking about. Um, organizations getting data about you that you are willingly give, giving up to them. Organizations understanding about your networks and therefore being able to um, make predictions about the way that you might behave. And then organizations who are able to capture a whole bunch of data from millions of people around the world and billions of data points and then being able to make predictions about the future. Um, just to finish off with a couple of interesting things, uh, Google CEO Eric Schmidt, uh, about five years ago, speaking at a conference, um, admitted that at Google one day they were talking about the fact that based on search results, they would be able to may, uh, predict the stock market. Uh, and then they decided that's probably Ill illegal, so they stopped doing it. They didn't say they can't do it, they're just saying that they won't do it. Uh, on the positive side, Google does predict and does make available for Google flu trends because this, as I say here, Google has found that certain search terms are good indicators of flu activity. So you can see here in Australia that around winter time in the middle of the year, flu activity is higher. And how does Google know that? Because as soon as people start getting flu symptoms or cold symptoms or whatever, they start doing Google searches for certain things. And Google can, uh, can detect that. It knows about uh, an outbreak of flu before pharmacists, doctors, and the health authorities. So they're making that information available publicly. And you can go to this, you can go to Google Flu Trends and see that. And healthcare authorities should be taking advantage of that to get, uh, it's an early warning system of things like things like flu activity. And Google search results are a perfect example of really big data. Okay, so as I said, please complete the exit survey and I'll send you the, the PwC report. And I think if, I'd, if you'd already downloaded that report beforehand and you'd never really heard about big data, it might have confused you. But I hope that you've now got a little bit more of a perspective of what big data is and what it can do for you. Um, I talk about things like the future and uh, big data is one of the areas that lots and lots of businesses are interested in. I've talked to financial planners about it, uh, real estate, insurance, and it's all about this idea of future proofing your business and your and sometimes it's about uh, your industry as well because big data can sometimes disrupt an industry and you as a business owner may need to be ahead of other people so you're not just competing with your competitors it may be somebody who comes along completely blindsides you uh, because they're doing something very differently um, I also talk about innovation collaboration. So I've got a, a, my uh, Bright Sparks keynote is all about taking advantage of the individuals in your organization. And uh, the other, uh, I'm, I'm sharing three of my six keynote topics here. The other one is about leadership because, of course, leaders need to be on top of this as well. Um, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to gihanperera.com. Please email me uh, at gihanagihanperera.com if you've got any comments after the webinar. I'd love to uh, have an email conversation with you. Uh, also, if you're registered, if you're watching this live, then uh, you're automatically registered for the next webinar coming up in the series, which is the last one for the year. And it's what I'm calling slow, bumpy, and expensive, which is uh, which is about this idea of disruption. So if there's anything slow, bumpy or expensive in your business or your industry, then that's the sort of thing that might make you vulnerable, but it's also the sort of thing which is a great opportunity for you. So if you're watching this live, then you don't need to do anything. You'll get the reminders automatically for this. If you are watching the web, uh, the recording of this, then please go to seeingintothefuture.com and register for the webinar series. And by the way, if you're already register for the webinar series and you, and you like this and you think this is a great webinar series for somebody else you know, please send them to seeingintothefuture.com. We'd love to have them on the series as well. And finally, thank you very much for taking part. I hope you've got something that you can take away and use in your business or maybe just in your personal life. And looking forward to having you back here next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.